स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया In this final lecture of the course, we will be proving the Little Picard's theorem. The Little Picard's theorem tells us that if you have a entire function which is non-constant, then it cannot omit two points. We have developed all the machinery needed to prove the theorem, but we will first give a characterization of uh, functions which holomorphic functions defined on a simply connected domain which omits two points. Let me state down the proposition. We will see how this is. Going to be used while we prove the Picard's theorem. So let's start with a domain omega, which is open connected and which is simply connected. Let omega be an open connected subset subset of C, which is simply connected. And suppose f is a function on omega which misses the 2.0 and 1 very specifically which omits 0 and 1. That means that f inverse of 0 is empty, f inverse of 1 is empty. That is precisely what it means. The conclusion is that then there exists a holomorphic function g on omega such that f of z is equal to minus of the exp of pi i times cos h of 2g, 2g of z. Let us give a proof of this. The moment it omits two points, we are forced to have some function g such that f can be written in this manner. Let us see why that is the case. The first observation is that if you consider c to c star, the exponential map, this is a covering map which we have already noticed and uh, f is now a map from omega to c star. Now, omega being a uh, open set is also locally connected and hence open connected and open connected, locally connected, simply connected, all those are satisfied, there exists a lift. Let us call that lift f tilde. We do not uh, have to care about the uniqueness part here, one lift should work. So, let f tilde be a holomorphic map, holomorphic function on omega such that x of f tilde of z, this is equal to f of z. From this f tilde, let us define a new function, define capital F of z to be equal to f tilde of z by 2 pi i. The reason why this capital F is being defined in such a manner is because if capital F takes integer values, so notice that if capital F of z is equal to n, then what do we have about f of say z0? Suppose f z0 is a point so that capital F of z0 is n, then f of z0 is going to be equal to x of f tilde of z0, which is going to be equal to the x of 2 pi i n for some integer n, which is equal to 1. But notice that f omits the value 1. So, this cannot happen, which is a contradiction. And what does that mean? That means that f capital F does not take integer values. The integers do not belong to the image. So, in particular, we have now two maps. We have a map from C star to C star given by Z square, Z going to Z square that is a covering map and we have omega to C star given by capital F. Notice that f does not take integer values, in particular f does not take the value 0, f does not take the value 0 and we have a lift which I am going to denote by square root of f. 
It's actually the branch of the square root function. We also have the following map c star to c star again z square and look at f of z minus 1. This also uh, is a map into c star because f does not take any integer values in particular it is not going to take the value 1 either and therefore we have a lift here. This is going to be square root of f of z minus 1 right. We do have now two holomorphic functions which is given by square root of f and square root of f minus 1. Let us define the function h of z to be equal to square root of f of z plus 1 or maybe I should be a little more careful square root of f of z minus square root of f of z minus 1. The first observation is that h does not have 0 in its image h of z 0 h of z is not equal to 0 for z in omega. Remember that h is uh, a function from omega into c. In fact, I am saying that it is into c star because if h of z is equal to 0 for some z then it means that f of z would be equal to f of z minus 1 which is a contradiction and therefore that is never going to happen. I am going to again consider the covering map exponential which is from c to c star and look at the map h now from omega into c star. We are again in a perfect setup to lift our uh, function. We are in effectively taking branches. If you uh, are uh, more comfortable with that language, this is a branch of the logarithm that we are actually considering. Let us call this lift g. I e exp of g of z, this is equal to h of z. Now, let us see what happens to cos h of 2 g of z, that is what uh, we are interested in right now. We will rather look at this plus 1. If you go up and look at the statement, it was cos h of 2 g of z times pi i that we are interested in, is not it? So, let us look at cos h of 2 g of z plus 1, what is this going to be equal to? By very definition, this is going to be equal to e to the power 2 times g of z plus e to the power minus 2 times g of z by 2 plus 1. That is the very definition of cos h, right? And if you notice, this is just e to the power g of z plus e to the power minus of g of z the whole square by 2. If we expand it out, that is going to be the same thing above. And we know what e to the power g of z is. e to the power g of z is exactly equal to h because after all g was the lift of h, right? The branch of the logarithm of uh, h. So, this is going to be equal to h of z plus 1 by h of z the whole square by 2. But what was h of z? h of z was square root of let me just write it down here, h of z was equal to square root of f of z minus square root of f of z minus 1. So, what is 1 by h of z? Should sit down and check that this is just going to be equal to square root of f of z plus square root of f of z minus 1. Just multiply in the numerator and denominator by square root of f of z plus square root of f of z minus 1, you will get this. And therefore, if you add it up, you are going to end up with 2 times f of z, right? So, we have cos 2 g uh, z plus 1 is equal to 2 times f of z. But what do we know about uh, e to the power 2 pi i times f of z? Let me just go up and remind you what our capital F was. Capital F was this. 2 pi i times f of z is f tilde of z and by very definition this is equal to the, let me write it down here e to the power 2 pi i f of z is the same as e to the power f tilde of z and f tilde was a lift of f. So, it is a branch of the logarithm of f. So, this is going to give you f of z back and what is it to the right? You multiply now this is just going to be equal to what was all this this is cos let me write down what it was here this is cos 
cos h 2 g of z plus 1. So, this is cos h 2 g of z plus 1. So, if you multiply by pi i and lift it, uh, take the power, this is going to be equal to e to the power pi i times cos h of 2 g of z times e to the power pi i which is minus 1 which is hence equal to minus of e to the power pi i cos h of 2 g of z and that is precisely what we were trying to prove. So, we have now got a function g which is defined on the uh, domain omega which is a simply connected domain which satisfies the condition f of z is equal to minus of the exp of pi i times cos h of 2 g of z. So, why did we deal with uh, such a weird function g? The reason is that uh, this g is special. It tells us, we will just uh, see in the next proposition that uh, g is a function which does not contain a disk of radius 1, any disk of radius 1 in its image. Let me write down the proposition and then we will prove it. The function g does not contain any disk, a disk or any disk of radius 1 in its image. So, if you have a disk D whose radius is greater than or equal to 1, then D cannot be contained in G of omega. That is precisely what the proposition says. Let us see why that is the case. The first claim here is that G does not intersect any points on the following set. G of omega does not intersect points in the set capital S which is given by plus or minus uh, log of root n plus square root of n minus 1 plus half of i m pi where n is greater than or equal to 1 positive integers and m belongs to integers any uh, set of integers. The first thing to note is that if uh, I have to capture uh, the, the set here on the complex plane, they are just going to be a complex, uh, they are going to be a grid of this sort with the points on the vertices. They are going to be exactly these points. This is what the, the points which are being darkened will be the points of capital S in this case. Now, let us see what is the, uh, assume that this claim is true. Let us assume for a moment that the claim is true and let us see uh, why this is going to give us a contradiction. Assume that, the, why not contradiction, why this is going to give us the proposition. Assume that the claim is true. The first observation is that if you pick any, uh, if you pick the diagonal of any uh, such rectangle here, we can bound them above. Why is that the case? Length and the breadth can be bounded in each of the rectangles given here. The length is going to be bounded by, or the, the, the height is going to be bounded by the, let me write it, the height of each rectangle is bounded by half of uh, i times m plus 1 pi minus half of i times m pi, the absolute value which is equal to pi by 2, which is in fact less than square root of 3. This is something which you should sit down and check. And what about the other uh, width? This is the height. Let us look at the width log of square root of n plus 1 plus square root of n minus log of square root of n plus square root of n minus 1. This is what we are interested in. So, plus or minus is there, but we are looking at the absolute value. So, what is going to be the absolute value here? 
the first observation should be that this is indeed greater than 0, the length is going to be greater than 0 and uh, that is not what we need, we need uh, an upper bound to check that this is indeed an upper bound, let us look at the function log of square root of x plus 1 plus square root of x minus log of square root of x plus square root of x minus 1. And if you consider this function, let us call it something phi of x, this is a decreasing function, check that phi is a decreasing function, some real analysis checks to be done which I will leave it to you, check that phi is a decreasing function and phi of 1 is less than 1, phi of 1 is just going to be equal to uh, log of root 2 plus 1 which is less than log of e which is 1. So, this is certainly uh, less than 1 and because it is a decreasing function, we have absolute value of log of square root of n plus 1 plus square root of n minus log of square root of n plus n minus 1, this is less than 1. So, the height and the width both are bounded by root 3 and 1 respectively, hence the diagonal of every rectangle, this is bounded by root 3 square plus 1, the root of that which is equal to 2. And therefore, if you consider any circle of any disc of radius 1, its diagonal will have distance or length equal to 2 and therefore, it will have to intersect some point in the grid that we just have. Hence, any disc of radius 1 intersects some point in S. So, if we prove indeed that uh, g of omega does not intersect this set S, we are done, we have our result. So, let us now try to see what happens if g of omega does intersect. Let z0 be some point in omega such that g of z0 is equal to plus or minus log of square root of n plus square root of n minus 1 plus half m i pi. We know that uh, f of z is equal to minus of uh, exponential of i pi times cos h to g of z. Let us see what happens to cos h to g of z, let us first focus on that cos h to g of z, this is going to be equal to e to the power 2 g, so let us put a 2 times cos h 2 g of z that is going to be equal to e to the power 2 g plus e to the power minus of 2 g, right and that is equal to what is e to the power uh, 2 g here that is going to be equal to e to the power i m pi times e to the power plus or minus log this, so this is going to be square root of n plus square root of n minus 1 plus square root of n 1 by square root of n plus square root of n minus 1 by multiplying by square root of n minus square root of n minus 1 the denominator becomes uh, oh there is a square involved so there is a square here there is also a square here this is precisely what we will be getting which is equal to e to the power i m pi is just minus 1 to the power m and this is just n plus n minus 1 plus 2 times something so, n plus n minus 1 is just 2 times n minus 1 and there will be a 2 times of this and the uh, 2 times square root of n into n minus 1 will cancel off. So, this is precisely what we end up with. So, what do we have cos h of 2 g of z naught, this hence is going to be equal to minus of 1 to the power m times 2 n minus 1, where 2 n minus 1 is going to be an odd number now for any integer n to n minus 1 is going to be an odd integer. Now, if you look at the x of pi i minus of x of pi i of cos h of 2 g of z 0, this is going to be equal to minus of x of pi i times minus 1 to the power m times 2 n minus 1. So, this is going to be 2 n minus 1 times pi i into minus of 1 to the power m. 
since 2n minus 1 is an odd number and cos of the minus term is not going to contribute, this is just going to be equal to minus of minus of 1 which is equal to 1. But the thing on the left is exactly equal to f of z0. So, if uh, g does intersect our set S, that means that f will take the value 1, which however is not possible and that which is a contradiction. So, effectively what we have proved is that, so let us summarize what we have done. Hence, so if f is holomorphic on omega which omits 0 and 1, there exists an entire function, there exists a holomorphic function g on omega which does not have a disk which does not have a disk of radius 1 contained in g of omega. This is precisely what we have proved till now. So, if f is a function on some simply connected set which omits 0 and 1, this is precisely what we have. Let me now state and prove the little Picard's theorem. Little Picard's theorem states the following. If f is an entire function which omits two points, then f is necessarily a constant. If f is an entire function which omits two points, that means two points, there exist two points which do not belong to at least two points which do not belong to the image of f, then f is constant, then f is a constant function. Let us give a proof of this, we have everything needed to do that. First observation is that C is a simply connected set and whatever we just said a few minutes back, that is quite relevant for our function f as well. But before that, it could omit any two points, right. So, let z0 be, z0 and z1 be two distinct points, distinct points which f omits. Notice that if you define, uh, consider f of, uh, the first observation is that we may assume without loss of generality that z0 is 0 and z1 is 1, that is the first observation. Without loss of generality that z0 is equal to 0 and z1 is equal to 1. Well, why can we do this? Because Otherwise, consider the function f1 of z defined to be f of z minus z0 by z1 minus z0. Notice that uh, since f does not take the value z0, f1 never vanishes. So, f1 omits uh, the origin and since f does not take the value z1, f1 never takes the value 1 i.e. f1 uh, is an entire function which omits 0 and 1. If you prove that f1 is constant, then that would also imply that f is a constant. So, we will assume without loss of generality that f is a function which omits 0 and 1. But then we now have by the proposition we proved in the beginning of this lecture, there exists a function g such that an entire function, let me be very uh, careful here, the function is defined on the entire omega, in that case omega here is c, so there is an entire function g such that f is equal to minus of the exp of pi i times g of cos h g of z cos h 2 g of z. Not only is it uh, a function which satisfies this condition and such that there does not exist a disk of radius 1 contained in the image of g.
let us assume that uh, f is non constant. Now, we are going to come to a contradiction. Assume f is non constant. If f is non constant, in particular g is also non constant, and because g is non constant, there exists some point z0 where its derivative does not vanish. So, let z0 be a point in C such that g prime of z0 is not equal to 0. And we will now consider a function h of z, define this function h which is defined as g of z plus z0 minus g of z0. What can we say about this function? Let us see what uh, the function h satisfies. Observe that h of 0, this is equal to 0 and h prime of 0 is precisely equal to g prime at z0 by the chain rule. So, this is something which we certainly have. Now, define a new function. Define h g everything is taken. So, let us call it psi. Psi is defined to be the following or oh, before that I am uh, slowly progressing towards a contradiction to the Bloch's theorem. So, before we go any further remember that h is an entire function, h is an entire function and the image of h does not contain a disk of uh, radius 1 either and since the image of g does not contain a disk of uh, radius 1, the image of this is after all composition by translations, pre-composition and post-composition by translations. So, uh, this will also certainly not have a disk of that is an exercise for you, h is an entire function and exercise. h does not contain a disk of radius 1 in its image. Because if there is a disk of radius 1 sitting inside the image of h, there is also going to be a disk of radius 1 sitting inside the image of g. We now have a setup where h is an entire function which maps 0 to 0 and h prime of 0 is not equal to 0. For r, some r positive um, and say less than capital R, we will define the following function. Define the function psi of z to be equal to 1 by r times uh, h of r z by h prime at 0. So, notice that whatever is there inside here, this, this is just multiplication by a complex number r by h prime at 0, h prime at 0 is not equal to 0 that is being used crucially. So, r by h prime at 0 is some function. Uh, which is multiplication by a constant. So, it takes 0 to 0 and again 1 by r is multiplication by in fact a real number. So, this makes perfect sense. Psi continues to be a function which is now in fact defined on the entire complex plane. This is a function which is in particular defined in a neighborhood of the unit disk as well. Let us see what is psi of 0. Psi of 0 is equal to 0 because uh, each of these functions map 0 to 0 and what about psi prime at 0? That is going to be equal to r by h prime at 0 that is the uh, the chain rule is being applied and then h prime at 0 is just going to be equal to h prime at 0 then 1 by r times z the, the derivative at 0 is 1 by r which is hence going to be equal to 1. So, we are now in the perfect setup to apply Bloch's theorem by Bloch's theorem, the disk of radius 1 by 72 is contained in psi of the unit disk. So, let us take some w now in d 0 r by 72 and if you look at w by r that is in the disk of radius 1 by 72 around 0 that is just going to be equal to then there exists z in d such that w by r is equal to what is what is psi of z psi of z is going to be equal to 1 by r times h of r z by h prime at 0. 
which implies that w is equal to h of some z uh, 1 or maybe z1 is already taken let me use z prime where z prime belongs to some uh, belongs to some this let's in particular say that it is in c this is true for every w in d0 r by 72 which tells us that d0 r by 72 is contained in h of c in the image of c but r was taken to be arbitrary for r large enough r by 72 is going to be greater than 1 and that is going to uh, be inside the image of h but that is a contradiction because the moment we have a uh, disk of radius greater than 1 sitting inside the image of h by this exercise it will also be there will also be some disk of radius greater than 1 sitting inside the image of g which is a contradiction. So, this is a contradiction to our assumptions and therefore, our assumption has to be false. The assumption that f is non-constant is false. This tells us that f is a constant function. And that completes the proof of the little Picard's theorem. With the conclusion of Picard's theorem, we have come to a conclusion of this course. There are multiple directions in which uh, you could take the study of complex analysis further. One could, for example, study the Riemann mapping theorem, go into more abstract objects called Riemann surfaces and study a generalization of the Riemann mapping theorem called the uniformization theorem. That is one direction you could take. Another direction you could take is by looking more deeper into harmonic functions and the further ramifications thereof, which is broadly called as the potential theory. One could also take up the study of uh, conformal mappings and quasi-conformal mappings. Or you could also jump into the direction of number theory where you study zeta functions, prime number theorem and such things. I hope that you have benefited from this course and uh, let me stop here by wishing you all the best in your future endeavors.